Okay, well, let me start by thanking uh, the organizers for carrying on this beautiful event. Um, so uh, since I understand that there's a bunch of students in the audience, I decided to run the, this talk as a sort of quick review on the topic, make an emphasis on why should we care about these new objects that have been arised in the last few years. So hopefully you'll bear with me and convince that this, this thing is useful. So, um, okay, I, I'm going to try to rush a bit because I think it might be uh, too much content for 25 minutes, but please stop me if you think that there's something that uh, it worth to expand. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess I don't have to convince you guys that the uh, strong coupling is something very recurrent in our daily work. And since uh, many IR phases of different uh, physical system uh, you might be interested, are usually strongly coupled, mostly in four dimensions and below. So we know that we cannot go around uh, just computing Feynman diagrams. We need to find uh, an alternative uh, way to obtain uh, results for observables. Um, and there are some tools that you uh, pretty much know, uh, which have been proved to be very useful in the last uh, decades. But uh, there is an additional handle that uh, was always there for at, at least uh, almost any physical system. You might be interested, and it is global symmetries. And we will see how we can use it to at least constrain uh, possible uh, outcomes of dynamical processes. So let me start by uh, going over very briefly about some classical lessons that we got from symmetries uh, along the years. So. Uh, a um, crucial notion that is going to be central in this talk is the so-called Landau paradigm, which essentially can be stated uh, by saying that IR phases of matter are classified in terms of how they realize global symmetries. And this is quite powerful because it allows to infer some predictions about dynamical phenomena, uh, which is usually hard or impossible to access uh, based on some kinematic observations. So typical example occurs, for instance, in a model of spins in a lattice. Uh, we know that as we vary some uh, relevant parameter, which I'm calling R here. Oh, by the way, ca can you see my mouse? Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yes. Great. Uh, so we know that as we tune this uh, some relevant parameter, we may land in a phase in which, the, in this case, the spin symmetry, which is a global symmetry, is broken, whether uh, we may land on a phase in which it's preserved or enhanced by a scale invariance. And uh, these phases are usually characterized by the expectation value of some local order parameter. And what we've been taught is that if we manage to, to get some effective action for this local order parameter, in principle, we could access to all the information in this phase diagram. And uh, as a byproduct of this uh, way of thinking, uh, we know that also that usually the presence of gapless matter is um, necessarily driven by some symmetry principle, let's say either a Goldstone theorem or a scale invariance. Other thing that we know pretty much is that symmetries are robust and as such they constrain energy and a powerful uh, tool uh, that materializes this notion is the, is the so-called anomaly, which is just a simple obstruction to, to consistently gauge all global symmetries and as such is not a real uh, pathology of, uh, of, uh, of a given theory, but as I said, it provides a very powerful tool. And this can be seen uh, in many in many ways, but one way to, to see this is uh, by the so-called anomaly inflow. So we know nowadays that uh, uh, a convenient way to describe an anomaly uh, of global symmetries by coupling our theory to uh, one uh, bulk in one higher dimension. And this bulk hosts the topological field theory that describes the anomaly. And as the RC flow is inherently local, it cannot affect uh, the anomaly theory here. So we know that the IR theory, whatever it is, uh, has to reproduce this anomaly, and this is the so-called anomaly matching. So a natural question is whether these considerations allow us to, to make predictions about everything we know. And the naive answer, of course, is not, because uh, there are plenty of examples that we may think of that doesn't uh, fit within this, these paradigms. But uh, in, instead of uh, going uh, over these examples, let me go to a more concrete one, probably less uh, interesting, but uh, concrete and simple enough just uh, to serve as illustration. And we will carry this example along the talk, uh, as you will see. 
So uh, the, um, the exercise that uh, I'm proposing is to compare uh, SUN uh, and PSUN n equal one super mill series. So uh, essentially the local structure is, is uh, essentially the same. The, both uh, groups have the same Lie algebra, the same uh, local degrees of freedom, and essentially the same spectrum of gauge invariant local operators. But globally, they start to differ. Well, first, there are some obvious uh, difference, which is the gauge groups are not the same. On one hand, we have SUN. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the quotient of SUN by the center. So as I said, SUN has a center, which is essentially a maximal uh, group of elements that commutes with everything. And by definition, PSUN doesn't. Uh, but more importantly, the a global difference between these, these, these two theories is that one has a genuine line operators, whether the other theory, PSUN and equal one super young mills, have a genuine uh, magnetic line operators or tough lines. And even more importantly, the apparent global symmetry of both theories uh, is uh, clearly different. In one case, we have a sort of chiral set to n symmetry here and just the minus one to the f in the other. So uh, it is quite instructive to, to study or compare the ground state, the structure of the ground state in these two theories. We know that both theories confine electric charge. In the case of SUN, we know that there's chiral symmetry breaking and it has this pattern. We know how it's realized in terms of uh, fermion bilinear that uh, serves as an order parameter for the symmetry breaking, which is stacked by the broken sedan as it should. And as it should, uh, it has n degenerate equivalent vacuum with the main walls that separate them, which are fairly understood. But on the other hand, uh, first, we don't have a chiral symmetry to break. So there, there's no notion of chiral symmetry breaking here in PSUN theory. But uh, still, people know that there's a fermion bilinear that uh, develops a web, and there are n degenerate vacua. So one may try, it, uh, one may wonder why this is happening if there's no symmetry supporting this. So let me list for you uh, some questions that we'll try to answer uh, along this talk. Uh, is is uh, Guzman? Uh, is there a Harry, there is a question by yeah. sorry? Can, uh, can I interrupt you already? Can you go back one slide? Yeah, of course. I was so by confine. <laughs> so by confinement in the right hand column. You don't mean center symmetry breaking because well there no, is no 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 yeah so yeah confinement, does... confinement here yeah yeah that's that's a, a very good question and, and quite inconvenient for me now but yeah <laughs> no no I mean confinement here it happens because there are magnetic uh, heating I mean th there is condensation of monopoles here so you know that there are flux tubes between electric charges but it is true that one cannot say that this is because there is a center symmetry that is broken that that's a very good. Uh, observation. I was trying Thank to you. hide it under the rug, but yeah, that's true. Thanks, Thanks for the answer. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, pretty much related to this question, uh, one may answer whether there is, whether confinement is related to some symmetry uh, breaking or preserving, as, as I just said, uh, in the case of SUN, we have a clear answer, but not, not that much in PSUN. Uh, in the case of SUN, we may ask whether there is an alternative scenario besides chiral symmetry breaking. Uh, in the case for PSUN, we may ask why is the vacuum degeneracy, for instance, if there's uh, any symmetry breaking uh, at work. And uh, we may ask, of course, about the notion of the domain walls. But uh, naively and from our standard understanding of symmetries, there's no clear answer to these questions. So it is tempting to say that maybe Landau was wrong, but if there's a takeaway message from, from this talk is that Landau is hardly wrong. And we better refine our notion of symmetry. And this is what people have been done uh, during the last few years. So let me briefly review for you uh, what's the novel perspective on symmetries. Let me start by a prototypical example, like, which is the U1 global symmetry. We know that uh, by another theorem, there's a conserved current. By integrating this conserved current on co-dimension one uh, closed manifolds, we construct charges. By the conservation, we know that the charges uh, commute with the stress tensor, and that allows us to deform this co-dimension one manifold at will, except that uh, we jump over uh, some charge operator, in which, in which uh, case the charge may change. Nothing 
we're here. Uh, and then it comes to the starring of this talk, which is the so-called topological symmetry defect or operator. In the case of U1, uh, this is just uh, the unitary that you get by exponentiating the charge. <clears throat> and you know that <clears throat> by our previous discussion, it has to satisfy these this, this properties. It, it has to depend topologically on, on this manifold, meaning that it can be the form that will. It has to reproduce, of course, the group, the group law, in this case U1, by the fusion of these extended operators. And it acts on local operators as usual. So now, so far, this has been like a fancy uh, rephrasing of the word identity, so nothing new. But there's a, there's a, an, a, an advantage already from taking this this uh, as, as act, an actual definition of global symmetry. There's a little one which is that already incorporates discrete groups, which doesn't have a local currents. But uh, it has a massive advantage. That is that generalization is ex extremely straightforward just by relaxing uh, thoroughly uh, some conditions in the definition. So our, our first generalization is the so-called higher form symmetries. So we will relax the, the condition for these operators to be co-dimension one. We will allow them to be uh, higher co-dimension P plus one. And uh, as such, they will link and act on the p-dimensional operators. So this is essentially uh, uh, summarized in these three pictures. So we still have this topological property. We can deform this at will. We can uh, we reproduce some uh, group law by the fusion of these operators. We act on extended operators in this way. And all these things, you can prove it explicitly in the case of U1 p-form symmetry by the existence of a p plus one conserved current. A bonus property of these higher dimensional uh, or, or these higher uh, generalizations of symmetries is that they are all abelian, uh, since there is no notion of ordering for higher co-dimensions. And uh, more importantly, these symmetries, pretty much as the ordinary, which are now zero form, right? Um, these symmetries can be spontaneously broken, but uh, an important uh, feature is that now, since the charge operators are uh, extended already, so the local order, the order parameters are non-local. Sorry, and the consequence of that is that Goldstone modes are in general in higher representations of Lorentz group. They may be vectors, as in the case of the photon. And finally, uh, a way to uh, explicitly break higher form symmetries is to introduce dynamical operators, which may serve as boundaries of these ex uh, charge extended operators, right? And this can be seen in this picture very easily, because if we want to keep on the topological property of this operator, there are two ways of computing the, its action. And it, since they have too much, then we need to impose this element to act trivial, right? So the, the symmetry is explicitly broken. Uh, well, just let me just mention without any proof that within these considerations, topological order has been uh, fit within the land of paradigm as discrete one form symmetry breaking. So uh, let me go over the, the toy example, uh, the usual example for uh, illustrating this, this higher form symmetries, which is just for the Maxwell. So we know that both by the equation of motion and by the VNK identities, we have two two form conserved currents, which are just the field strength and the dual field strength. This gives rise to two one form symmetries, which are electric and magnetic. And they are called like that because if you compute the charges, uh, you obtain Gauss law and magnetic flux as usual. And these are the only uh, global symmetries in 4D Maxwell theory, right? An additional, uh, uh, sorry, this is sigma two. Um, an additional thing that one may say about this theory is that, of course, this theory is not confining, it's just Maxwell theory. And uh, the Wilson lines uh, do not have area law, have perimeter law. Well, in this case, it's Coulomb law, but the point is that they don't have area law. And uh, we know that then the electric one form symmetry is spontaneously broken in a Coulomb phase, like Maxwell theory. And so the photon is what we are now understand that is the Goldstone. Uh, for this higher one form symmetry breaking. So th there's now a symmetry principle behind the absence of mass of a photon. But let me go to the main example, which is uh, in this case, SUN super young mills. So we know that SUN young mills has a center one form symmetry. I will try to rush a bit. Uh, 
So essentially, the, the important thing about this is that Wilson lines are uh, labeled by, by representations of the gauge group. And in particular, for the one form central symmetry, the charge of a given line is given by the so-called enality of the representation, which is the number of boxes number n, uh, modulo n. The important thing about this is that the adjoint representation is neutral. So uh, fundamental Wilson lines, for instance, cannot be screened by adjoint matter. And this implies that uh, SUN super Yan Mills has uh, a sudden one form symmetry as well. But this theory, of course, has a, a well-known symmetry, which is the UNR symmetry, which acts, acts chirally on the, on the gauge genome. And as we know, uh, it has an ABJ anomaly. This is not a global anomaly. This is a gauge anomaly. So it usually involves that the symmetry is broken. In this case, it, by using the SUN bundle quantization, one can check that the symmetry is actually broken to set to N, as we said at the beginning. But this set to an uh, global symmetry now has a mixed global anomaly with the one form symmetry. And this can be seen again by uh, computing the, the, the bundle quantization, but now in presence of uh, background fields for the one form symmetry. Of course, I, I, I'm not gonna explain uh, how you construct this, but this, this is the way you do it. And by this change, by, by this modification in the quantization, you may check that there is a seven inside this set to n which participates in a mixed anomaly with the one form symmetry. So beside the technicalities, what's the use of this anomaly? Well, now we can use soft anomaly matching and uh, try to infer some conclusions about the vacuum. So we know that by the presence of the symmetry, the theory cannot flow to a trivially gap phase with uh, both symmetries preserved. So if we assume confinement, because well, in this theory, we know that it occurs, there's no other choice but for the one-form symmetry to be broken. So chiral symmetry breaking is, in this case, implied by an anomaly. So we were able to uh, give a symmetry principle answer to the first two questions. One is whether confinement is related to symmetry breaking preserving. Well, as I said, in this case, at least for SUN, confinement is it's well understood as one-form symmetry preserving because the order parameter needs to present area law, right? Uh, the, um, for the second question, uh, we know that an alternative scenario is not possible because uh, it's ruled out by, by, by an anomaly with the one form symmetry. So chiral symmetry breaking has to occur in this case if confinement occurs. Uh, well, in order to, to give an answer to these uh, last two questions, I have to introduce a new notion of symmetry, which is called non-invertible. This is a bit more technical as we are um, we need to, to relax the condition for these elements to, to close a group, but it's fine. So now the, we will allow for elements that uh, close something called the fusion category. It's not important, but uh, let me just say this. So consider that you have a theory with a set of topological co-dimension one operators. We will focus on co-dimension one, even if there are examples of higher non-invertible symmetries. And the fusion rules in general can be written in this way and are characterized by these numbers integer numbers. So groups are encoded, are, are particular cases of these numbers, but in general, this will be, will describe what is called a category. So uh, as I said, I'm not going through details on what the category is, but the, the important thing here is that categories are robust and pretty much uh, like ordinary symmetries. Uh, they can be used to constrain Archie flows. So, uh, well, yeah. I have prepared a bit of the icing model, which is one of the classical examples, but let me go through, let me go directly to an example that I think you might find more, more interesting, which is just QED. So very surprisingly, uh, QED has an infinite set of non-invertible symmetries. Let's see how this, this happens. So, uh, well, classically, we all know that QED has a one form axial, a zero form uh, U1 axial uh, rotation symmetry. We are considered QED with only one flavor. But at the quantum level, we know that this symmetry is broken by an ABJ anomaly. In this case, it is broken to zero. And this uh, breaking by an anomaly can be phrased in terms of a non conservation equation for the axial uh, current. So by this non-conservation equation, of course, we know that if we try to exponentiate the, the, the would-be conserved charge, this will fail to be topological. That's fine. But now we may try to do better. And this is what these people did uh, recently. 
So from now on, I will focus on phases which have rational values like two pi over, over n, but uh, for, for some reason that I, I hope it's, it's gonna be clear soon, but uh, let me focus on this sort of phases. So I can try to improve my operator just uh, for it to be topological by hand, by imposing, you know, uh, subtracting whatever it happen is happening when the D uh, hits a star JA. So this operator by construction is topological but it fails to be a uh, gauge invariant, precisely because the Chern-Simons term here is not uh, properly quantized. Uh, but this beast, we have seen it before, uh, uh, at least for the uh, condensed math uh, aficionates, this is the, the response function of a fractional quantum whole state. And uh, our good friends in condensed math department have already understood how to represent this in a gauge invariant way. And this can be done at the expense of introducing a new U1 gauge field that now is coupled to, to A in this form. So this is a manifest ligation variant by construction. And if you integrate out C, it reproduces this response function. So this is uh, the, the operator that we may construct and, and it is topological and gauge invariant by construction. As I say, the price to pay is to introduce a new degree of freedom that now is restricted to live here on sigma three, right? On, on the manifold in which this operator is defined, this guy is integrated out, but it's not in the bulk. So in the bulk, the, the bulk physics remains being QED, just plain QED. So the natural question is whether this describes an ordinary symmetry and the answer as you may guess is no. The reason for that is that this operator do not have inverse. So you may try and you won't find any. So uh, for instance, that can be seen that uh, if you compute the fusion of this operator with its putative uh, inverse, what you get is, is, is something of, of this form, uh, which is called a condensation defect. Again, this is a bit of a technical point. I'm not describing exactly what the condensation defect is, but believe me that it is not the identity because even if in local operators don't see it, it's transparent for local operators, it may act non-trivially on lines. So this is not the identity, but it's fine. It's a non-invertible operator. Uh, as I said, it, these operators act uh, as ordinary chiral rotations on local operators. So that now only we are, we are only restricted to, to rational phases. And now this is manifest because it's the only way we can use the fractional quantum Hall state. For, for, for any value of the rotational phases, this is not possible. Uh, and this, these guys also uh, may act non-trivially on magnetic lines by some version of the Witten effect, which I don't have time, I uh, have uh, three minutes, so I, I don't have time yeah, to... Yeah, that's, that's the thing, it's 25 minutes, so whenever you yeah. want. Yeah, so let me try to get to the point. So in this, in this uh, interesting uh, example, we've seen that ordinary U1 chiral symmetry Instead of being broken by the ABJ anomaly, it, be, it gets mutated in an infinite set of chiral symmetry rotations labeled by uh, rational numbers, and uh, these are non-invertible. And there are many interesting physical interpretations, which I uh, don't have time to go through, but, but they are very, very interesting. So now let's try to use this intuition in the last two minutes to, to solve a, uh, our PSUM problem. So as we said, PSUN gauge group is defined by uh, taking SUN and quotienting by the sudden center symmetry. But we also learned that the center symmetry is realized in terms of a one form symmetry. So what we need to do is to gauge the one form symmetry. That's fine. So we take uh, our uh, quantization condition of an SUN bundle with now with the insertion of the background fields for the one form symmetry and we gauge it, that is, we make it dynamical. So the expression is exactly the same, but now this little b, which is the true form dynamical sudden gauge field is integrated over. So nothing, nothing weird, but it has a massive consequence. I mean, and, and this consequence is the following. Remember that we've seen that there is a mixed anomaly between the chiral set to n chiral symmetry in, in SUN gauge theory and the one form symmetry. But now we are gauging the one form symmetry. So we are making this symmetry, this anomaly uh, ABJ like. So it's not a mixed anomaly between global symmetries anymore, but it's ABJ. So a naive conclusion would be like, okay, then this, a certain part of set to N is completely broken and that's it, end of the story. But from the QD example, we know now that this implies that these N elements 
now get mutated to n non-invertible symmetry defects, but they are still there. So now it's uh, uh, I'm going to give you some statement without proof, so it can be shown that this symmetry is responsible of the end degeneracy of Bakke of PSU and super young mills. And regarding the domain walls, let me just say that one can sort of understand it, uh, these domain walls in terms of these non-invertible uh, symmetries. One uh, important feature that these domain walls will have is that they will inherit non-invertible fusion algebra. In this, in this case, they will, they will form a category. And something uh, interesting about these domain walls is that they may map vacua which are not equivalent. So uh, let me just finish by saying that, okay, so we gave uh, some symmetry principle based uh, answers to these last two questions. So why is there vacuum degeneracy in PSU and theory? Now we know that this, because non there is a non-invertible chiral symmetry. And uh, this is consistent with the categorical fusion algebra. And the domain walls in PSU and theory, which just say that they satisfy non-trivial fusion algebra and may connect non-equivalent to general vacuum. Yeah? So now Landau paradigm sort of re-emerges in this case. Uh, so, well, uh, let me just give you some final remarks. So by generalizing the notion of global symmetry, we learned that we got more tools to describe the IR physics in, in, in models uh, where naively uh, ordinary symmetries fall short. And uh, of course, this is a developing framework, but it's successfully tested again known results. And there are already some new insights, which are very interesting. Uh, most remarkably, I strongly recommend you to check this paper about the chunk UCD. And hopefully they will become a powerful tool in the near future. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jerem. Um, questions for Jeremias? Yeah, it was a bit uh, okay. quick, probably. But no, yeah. No. Let, let, let me ask one. So while people, okay, Anthony has a question. Go, Anthony. Sure, sure. Oh, yes, I'm. I'm curious about some uh, some statements. Uh, what has naturalness to do with QED? Because oh, you, you mean you mean because uh, yeah, yeah. What you are referring probably is to this, right? Q yeah, this, this is exactly exactly. This is in, in in the following sense. I mean, because you know, take massless QED, right? So uh, forget for for a moment about the ABJ anomaly. Okay, um, massless QED has a chiral symmetry, right? And so according to the usual uh, uh, paradigm by Wilson, so the, the, along the RC flow, there cannot uh, generate anything that violates the global symmetries already present, right? So in principle, right. if, we, if we forget about the anomaly for a moment, in principle, massless QED would be natural in the sense that mass, a mass cannot generate, right? Right. Then you realize that there's an IVJ anomaly and the, the story is a bit more complicated. But for instance, Toft argued that, okay, in R4, massless QED is still natural because in R4, there are 